Let's listen together to the scripture coming from Colossians 3, uh, verses 12 to 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. We are a chosen people. Chosen not for privilege, but chosen for service and for witness to the kingdom of God. Now, we all might think that when we got up this morning, that we made a decision to come to church. We came at our own choosing, and that is true. But I would also say that there is a deeper truth, that there is something of the purpose and the wonder and the mystery of God that implants within us the prompting, the desire to get out of ourselves and to connect with other people and to connect with deeper purposes, purposes that we try to fulfill here in this community as so many other faithful groups of people do as well. We may have chosen to come, but it is God who prompted and invited and who bids us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We've been chosen. We've been called. But being chosen is not about privilege. It's not about status. It's about something more. Well, Tuesday is a pretty important day in the life of our nation, is it not? It's voting day. I do hope you will vote. Vote red, vote blue, vote purple, vote green, vote pink, but vote. Because we are blessed with the democracy and participating in that is something not everybody gets to do. Well, through this election season, I don't know about you, but I get just a little troubled when a political candidate tells me that they're Christian. I, I'm just not quite sure what, what they mean when they say that. Do they mean that they are devoted to the God revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Well, I hope that. But sometimes I get a little cynical. But you already know that about me, don't you? Sometimes I wonder when they say I'm Christian, what they really mean is I'm not Jewish. I won't be pursuing that agenda. 
But it might mean that I'm not Muslim, so I won't be advocating for an Islamic agenda. Or maybe what they mean is I'm not an atheist, so I won't be pushing forward secular humanism. So you can understand why I'm just a little confused when politicians invoke the Christian label. Sometimes I think what they mean is that Christianity is meant to be a place of privilege. That this is a Christian nation and Christians ought to be the ones who make the decisions. And I recoil just a little bit. You see, we really never ever were a Christian nation. And I have a bachelor's degree in history, so I, I know what I'm talking about. You remember, well you don't remember, but the Constitutional Convention? <laughs> we hold these truths, the statement begins. But did you know that when that convention was convened in Philadelphia, Thomas Jefferson, a Christian, was asked to sort of begin the process by uh, bringing a document for the Constitutional Convention to perfect. And so Mr. Jefferson got in front of the august body and he read this paragraph. We hold these truths to be sacred, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now no sooner had Thomas Jefferson got that line out of his mouth when Ben Franklin jumped up and he objected and he said, you can't say sacred, that's a religious term. And we're not a religious nation. He moved the adoption and amended the document to say, we behold these truths to be self-evident an appeal not to God, but an appeal to reason. In our very founding, we were never envisioned as a Christian nation. And I would say as a Christian leader on the eve of an election, that I would want to ask all Christian people not to use the power of the state to advance religious concerns. And my reasoning is somewhat selfish. Christians may enjoy the majority now but everything we know about the coming demographics of our country is that that will not be true in the years that are ahead of us. And if we use the power of the state to advance our concerns in this moment, we are setting a future table in which the power of the state could be used against us. If we are the majority now, we should use that majority status graciously with an eye toward what will be. Well, someone I deeply respect and admire confessed to me that she had a little trouble with my sermon title and I'm so glad that she said so. No, it wasn't Kathy. <laughs> she said the idea of a chosen people conjures up all kinds of negative images. 
mostly a presumptuousness about life. But Paul dispels that myth. And in the third chapter to the Colossians, Paul takes away any type of presumptuousness about being chosen. Just listen to the way he defines what being chosen means. Compassion. Kindness. Humility. Meekness. And patience. It means forgiveness and love. Being chosen means helping one another to gain a sense of wisdom and living with gratitude. See, there's nothing there in the Pauline letter about being chosen as a place of privilege, but it's an invitation to a new way of life. Nicholas Kristof describes what it means to be chosen. He wrote an editorial in the New York Times in which he describes our spiritual sisters and brothers of the Jewish faith, those who were chosen before us. He writes this. When the bigot who shot up a Pittsburgh synagogue, arrived at the local hospital emergency room to be treated for the injuries, he was still shouting, kill all the Jews. He was then promptly treated very professionally by three Jewish people. The hospital president, Jeffrey K. Cohen, a member of the congregation that had been attacked, met with the suspect to ask respectfully how he was doing. The shooter inquired who he was. He answered, I'm Dr. Cohen, the president of the synagogue, the president of the hospital, and a member of the Tree of Life synagogue. You see, being chosen isn't about privilege or safety. Being chosen is about responding to a much deeper impulse implanted in us by God. Christoph goes on to write, side by side with the worst of humanity, we find the best. And in Pittsburgh, there was more of the best. The Muslim community promptly raised $214,000 for the victims of the synagogue shooting and offered to provide security for the Jews in that area. Now, being called isn't about being special. It isn't about having a place of status and privilege. It is about the angels of our better nature being blessed and coaxed out of us by the mystery of our God. I have a friend who is a United Methodist pastor in the Pittsburgh area, and I read his blog this week, and he describes his interaction I reached out to Rabbi Jeremy to see if there was anything we could do 
to support him in the temple Oha Shalom. He said that the board was having an emergency meeting that night and that he would get back to me. The result of that meeting was an invitation from the people of Temple Oha Shalom to the churches and to the faith organizations and to our local ministerial association to join them for their Friday Sabbat service on November the 2nd. This, they suggested, would serve as a show of support and solidarity and might help calm the fears of congregants about coming to synagogue for the first time after what had happened at the Tree of Life. As I write this, he said, we have 25 faith communities and ministerial organizations which will be present at the service, as well as 25 clergy and faith leaders, including Protestant and Catholic, Muslim, Buddhist, Unitarian, and Mormon. The gratification in this show of solidarity is that it is truly a remarkable moment. And as you have read in the countless stories in the aftermath of this horror in Squirrel Hill, the broad display of love and empathy and we stand with you solidarity may be one of the biggest God moments I have seen in my life. We are a chosen people Chosen not for privilege, but for service and for witness. Amen.